Hello, my name is Randy Davis. I'm with Grand Design. I'm here today to answer a few common questions that we get at some of the rallies. Let's get started. When inspecting seal lamps, what should I look for? Well, this right here is a type of seal. This right here is a trim molding. Now the seals and the moldings both have seals on them. If you look closely along this edge, you will see that there is a slight bit of silicone, a thin layer on the edge. On this interior edge, you're also going to find a slight bit of silicone. What you're looking for is voids or openings or gaps. Any of those gaps need to be cleaned thoroughly and then filled with uh, new silicone. What type of sealant should be used? The seal that we normally use at, at the factory is 100% silicone. It comes in different brands. It can be purchased locally at your automotive store. We also use plastic putty knives to clean the sealant out from the trims. So if you have a void or a gap in your seal, what you do is you take your plastic scraper and you scrape along the edge and you want to clean that up. Prep is the biggest part of your seal. So once you get the surface prepped, then you want to put a little bit of silicone on there. And if you take your putty knife, if you have a hole, you can rake it down into the hole and make sure you clean it thoroughly when you're done. How often should we check the sealants? Sealants should be checked a minimum of quarterly, every three months. There is one more thing that I would like to make sure that you're aware of. On your extrusion metals, on your slide outs particularly, uh, it, they have putty tape that in behind the rail. Now, in the heat and over time, the putty tape can ooze out and it will push the seal away. So what you would need to do at that point would be to scrape and clean any residual putty that's left, clean all of the silicone, prep your surface, and run you a nice clean bead back down through there, and that should be all you need to do. Now we're on the roof of your RV. This is the sealant that you're going to be inspecting. What you're looking for is you're looking for peeling, bubbling, holes, uh, any damage possibly from tree limbs. Uh, this is the sealant that you should be using on the roof. This is a self-leveling sealant and it's made by Alpha. Alpha is the company that makes the roof. They recommend strictly soap and water, wash your roof on a regular basis. When you're washing your roof, that is the time to inspect your seals. This is what they call non-sag. This will puddle just like this for you and make a nice self-level. This is for the outside edges so that it won't droop and run down the sidewall. We should check our roof a minimum of quarterly. Uh, I would suggest though if you are going down a country road or a back road and you, or an RV park and you happen to drag some tree limbs, I would immediately get on the roof and check it. Nothing will kill your RV faster than water. What is the ladder rated at on the side of my unit? The foldable ladders on the side of the units are rated at 300 pounds. What should you clean the roof with? You should only clean the roof with mild soap and water. A soft bristle brush, a bucket of water, use extreme caution because when you get this uh, wet, it definitely gets slick. What types of roof conditioners are recommended or are they? I personally do not recommend any type of uh, conditioners. There are a lot of companies out there that have a lot of good products, but there's also a lot of companies that don't understand some of the products that they're asking you to apply it to. Uh, I have seen in several situations where a particular sealant that was okayed to apply to the entire roof dried it out and cracked it and the roof had to actually had to be replaced. How long is the warranty on the roof? The warranty on the roof is 12 years. And now we're looking at the slide out roof. The slide out itself is uh, very neglected on a regular basis. Leaves, debris, different materials fall down, they hit the top of this roof, and then when the slide rim goes in, it gets stuck underneath the seal and creates leaks. The tape that is applied over the top of the, between the trim and the roof is a Tedlar tape. It is uh, specially designed for this application. Uh, it is very difficult to remove but it should be inspected on a regular basis to make sure it's not peeling. On my new unit, I have wrinkles on my roof. Is that something that I need to be concerned about? Wrinkling like this should not be a concern. What's happening here is the roof is the, the material for the roof is attached with glue. As the sealer goes on, it has a chemical bond to the roof. As a result, it's got off-gassing, and the off-gassing will cause a slight 
rippling of the uh, material. If you get huge bubbles in the middle of the roof, that's a whole other issue. How do we properly operate our slide outs? The proper method to extend your slide outs would be to locate your unit on a nice level surface, run the leveling system down, stabilize the unit, walk around the unit to make sure there is no obstructions, the slides are not going to hit anything when you extend them, go around the interior of the unit and make sure that there's no drawers that have come open and travel, anything that's got caught in behind the uh, face board of the slide out, especially with today with the cell phones operating your slide rooms, you should never just operate your slide room without going in and inspecting it first. Damage can be very extensive. Okay, now we're under your slide out. We've had several questions regarding the through frame slide out. Now when we say through frame, it's literally through the frame. The, the gears along the bottom of this tube should be cleaned and lubricated periodically. The shaft itself should be cleaned and lubricated periodically. It can be cleaned with a standard brake cleaner that you can pick up at any automotive parts store. Lippert recommends the power lube, which can be purchased at any Amazon store. How often should we lubricate the slides? The slide should be inspected and lubricated a minimum of quarterly. Now, I would suggest that every time you run it out, give it a look, see if see how dirty it is. Obviously, dirty roads, uh, dirt roads, things like that, will uh, need more maintenance than a nice, clean highway. Up here, you will see the head. Now, the head of the slide out is where all the adjustments are made. I do not suggest that the retail customers start adjusting on this. What I do suggest is that you get underneath here and make sure that all of the bolts are tight and in place and nothing is moved. Don't be alarmed if you see a paint mark where it, it looks like something is moved. When the frames are built prior to them coming to the factory, they're painted. When the factory does the adjustment, there will be a paint line here. This is a little different style slide out. What you have here is you have gears that run back and forth. You have two motors on this type of slide out. This is the Schwintec slide and it's the only slide that I know of that you're supposed to stay on the button until the slide stops by itself. If you run the through frame like we were showing you earlier, you'll have a clutch sound. Uh, you'll, a lot of people call it the banging sound when it gets to the end stop. Uh, there is a clutch in there that's designed not to tear the system up. This particular system though sinks itself as you hold the button. So you should always hold the button down until it fully stops or fully retracts. In the gears, you should never put lubricant on these. Uh, internally, they're, they're made with uh, nylon or Teflon bushings and gears and slides, and there is no reason whatsoever to lubricate this. More damage can be caused by lubricating it than not lubricating it. The only thing you should have to do to these is keep it clean. Should your leveling jacks be cleaned and lubricated? The rams on your leveling system, the shaft that comes out of the body should be cleaned on a periodic basis. If you would like to spray them with a dry lube, I'm sure that would be fine. Internally, they're holding hydraulic fluid. So the net, uh, the, there's a seal at the bottom that is supposed to scrape and clean the shaft. When you need to clean the shaft the most is when you've left it sit for long periods of time with the jacks extended. So what fluid do you use to, to refill the reservoir? And how do you do it? Well, the very first thing that you want to do is you want to retract all of the jacks and all of the slides before you ever determine whether this needs fluid or not. You want to be, use caution because the vent cap, it's actually vented. You uh, do not want to fill this thing all the way to the top. If you fill it all the way to the top, it will spill out. The, a little bit of, of oil residue around the cap would be normal because it does breathe. It's a breathable system. It has to let air in as the fluid goes down and it has to let air out as the fluid comes back. Automatic transmission fluid is the general fluid that's used in this. Uh, light grade hydraulic oil. My jacks often pop at night and it scares the crap out of me and my wife. What, what's going on there? Why does it do that? Different fluids expand and contract with temperature at different rates. The hydraulic fluid that's generally installed in most of your RVs on the road today, it expands and contracts with temperature. So what happens is, is during the course of the day you set your RV up. 
over the course of the nighttime, when the air temperature cools down, the fluid will start to contract. The jacks will move so minutely that you can't feel it, but you can hear it. That's the popping noise. What we recommend is fork oil. The fork oil, you can get at any local motorcycle shop. Uh, what this does is it changes the temperature, var temperature variations. It expands the expansion and contraction temperature so that uh, 10 to 15 degrees won't do it. It's going to have to be more like 50 or 60 degrees splan before it's going to actually pop. Now, do we add, just add that to it, or should we take out a... What you should do is retract all your jacks first to make sure where your fluid level is. Remove about a quart of hydraulic fluid from the unit and install the quart of hydraulic fluid oil, the, flu the fork oil. Um, at that point, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to extend and retract all of your slide rooms and all of your jacks several times to mix this through the entire system. Once this gets completely mixed into the system, the popping should stop. I have an older solitude, and when I'm operating the rooms or my jacks, I push the button and the jacks go down for a little bit and then they stop. What, what's going on there? There are several things that that could be attributed to. The first thing that I would check would be the circuit breaker. If the circuit breaker trips, then all power to the pump is lost, which means it will stop operating. Um, most of the circuit breakers are automatic reset. So if you give it just a few minutes, it'll reset and it'll operate again. That's why you can run it, stop, run it, stop. The only way to find that out would be to actually have a voltmeter on the battery, and at this point I would recommend taking it to a service technician. Hey Randy, one more thing. Um, why, before we walk away, I have a newer momentum, and I have wires that say solar, but they're not going to anything. They're just capped off. What, what's going on that, with that? What that is, is that is your solar prep. Up on the roof, you have what's called a gland. The gland is where you attach the solar panel to. In a solar prep situation, it's wired, but you're going to have to buy the pieces to finish it. The solar panel goes up on the roof and attaches to the gland, which comes down and feeds these wires here. Never hook those wires directly to the battery. They have to go to a regulator. The regulator will regulate the voltage and the amperage to the battery. In direct sunlight, these solar panels can put out as much as 40 volts. That would be a bad thing if it was hooked directly to the battery. For those of you who do not winter camp, we would recommend winterizing your unit. We're going to show you a brief explanation of how to winterize using the Nautilus system. You're going to want to refer to your owner's manual on how you should properly drain your hot water tank, your fresh water tank, as well as your black and gray tank prior to this process. You will also want to take care of your black flush tank valves as well. Here's the video on how to properly winterize using the Nautilus system. You will now go to your Nautilus panel and locate the winterize section. Turn your knobs in the direction that the winterize section is telling you to turn them. You will then take a piece of garden hose and put the garden hose into the city water inlet. Be sure to remove the screen prior to inserting the hose. Be sure to screw the hose on very tight to prevent any leaking. A short piece of garden hose would work the best. Once that's attached, you will take the other end of the garden hose and place it into a gallon jug of antifreeze. Once that's placed in the antifreeze, you will turn the pump on. It will begin to suck the antifreeze from the jug. If you have a problem with that, you can go ahead and lift the jug up. You'll then go inside and run the antifreeze through the hot and cold lines of your kitchen sink. Turn on your bathroom sink and do both hot and cold, as well as your toilet. You will then go to the shower and do the same thing, hot and cold lines, and allow the antifreeze to come through. Once all of the interior lines have been completed, go to your exterior lines, any outdoor showers, as well as your low point drains, 
and put antifreeze through them by opening them and allowing the antifreeze to flow through. You will then remove the hose from the city water inlet, replace the screen, and go ahead and plug it back up. You can then remove your water filter and dump the antifreeze that has been collecting within the container. We advise of disposing the water filter if you have one in there. You do not need to place a new one back in until you dewinterize for the camping season. Put that back on, tighten it up, turn off your pump, and you can clean up any of your antifreeze mess that may have dripped down from the inlet and your winterizing process is complete. Hi, I'm Jim Hinkle. I happen to have a 2017 Grand Design Reflection 297 RSTS. And very recently we introduced the Grand Design Owners Technical Forum where you can go get technical answers to any question that you have. You can find us on gdrvowners.com. I'm one of the senior moderators and I'd be glad to help you out. Hi everyone, Lance Lees here at Grand Design RV talking to you a little bit about our slide boxes today. Uh, while there's a lot of different ways to build a slide, wall, a slide box or a wall, uh, here at Grand Design we choose to laminate it. What a lot of other manufacturers do is they choose to do a hung wall. You know, the kind that you push on the wall and it moves in and out, allowing hot and cold air and moisture to uh, come in and out with it. Uh, by laminating this wall, uh, it's rock solid, it's airtight, comes back with Grand Design's three-year structural warranty. Uh, the, the real advantage to, in my eyes is that with the gel coat exterior, water's going to fall away, which is great. But when the walls come together, there are, we identify that as a water intrusion point. We utilize a Mylar PVC tape, and just like a PVC pipe, it's impervious to water. So we're wrapping all these seams where water could potentially come in to ensure water does not. Uh, another area we use the Mylar PVC tape is around the, the uh, metal fascia and around the skirting. Uh, in your search for RVs, you'll probably notice some of the screw heads will fall off and there'll be rust and some warp wood. That's all because of wa that water intrusion. By wrapping that Mylar PVC tape and bringing sticky Darko moisture barrier, it's gonna ensure that water is gonna fall away from your RV versus into the RV. Another way that we're able to uh, ensure water stays out is we actually grade the roof 15 degrees. So on a rainy day, water's gonna fall away from the RV versus into the RV. The other advantage to that is that as the slide out gets taller and taller and taller, the seal gets tighter and tighter and tighter, uh, ensuring that you're gonna have less draft uh, and then less, uh, less water intrusion at, at, that, at that point of entry. Let's go inside and sh check out a couple other uh, ways that we're building our slide boxes bigger, better, and stronger than the competition. Here inside is another great example of how we grade our roof so that water falls away and not into the RV. You could notice how it kind of tapers away so the water falls out. The other advantage of that is the slide out goes out, the seal up top gets tighter and tighter and tighter to keep draft in any water and moisture out of your RV. Insulation is a pretty big key uh, on a slide out box because it is the moving room. So we take it a step further there too with a one inch thick floor and insulation all the way through. So all these are contributing factors to why Grand Design slide boxes are going to have less maintenance, are be more reliable, and keep you and your family camping and out of the service department. Please keep them in mind as you're shopping for your next RV. Thanks for taking the time and have a great day. Angel DiCarlo of Grand Design RV along with Mike Bontrager who is the production manager for Solitude. We're talking not just about Solitude today but all our brands. Really a golden thread with the Mylar tape and you'll see that on this side right here versus the competitors you're going to see Butyl Putty often used. Uh, Mike, kind of just explain uh, the difference between the use of the Mylar tape versus the Butyl Putty. Uh, the way your competitor, our, our competitors will do it is they'll put uh, Butyl tape behind their rails and as you can see in here, you'll see that you can't really see any butyl tape. And right here, you're on the surface. And then we left this on so you guys can see it'll start to ooze. And when it oozes, it'll actually break the caulk away of it from it. And, and you'll have to be scraping the butyl. And, uh, and Angela, why don't you get in here and scrape this butyl? And you can see what kind of pain it is to having to scrape that and the, 
the yeah, maintenance that's, of that. Is. That's 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 a lot of fun. I mean, that's going to take me me all day. Versus, obviously, if we're using the mylar tape, we don't have to worry about this, right? I that's mean, right. that's the beauty of the mylar tape. I mean, look how long this is going to take me to do, and I haven't even I haven't even done it right. You know, I mean, obviously, I could be better at this, but man, that's uh that's a lot of fun. You know, I'm not having man. So if we had, um, but that's the difference. With the Mylar tape, you're not worrying about this, this scraping. The, the maintenance is, is much lower and you don't have to worry about doing all the work that I'm doing right here. Yeah, the, the Mylar has a much cleaner look. Uh, you can see with the Butyl how far you're, uh, it'll hold the rails out from the sidewalls. But on the, the, the Mylar, we're up nice and flush with the, with the sidewalls. It's a consistent gap, and you don't see you don't see any waviness with it as like you do with the uh, the butyl. And, and obviously, I had tough time here. I still don't have it looking great, but um, there's so many other areas where you're gonna have this. This is just a yeah. very small area yeah. that you. I'm have. just showing you the rear, rear right. rail, but at the in the competitors, you'll have it around the windows, uh, around the reefer openings their baggage doors, your, your water heater. So all those openings, you're asking for a potential uh, butyl oozing out. And here at Grand Design, the openings you mentioned, we seal those with PVC foam and like the Mylar, uh, it's not gonna break down. And we put a second layer of protection on with silicone as well. So, you know, again, with us, it's less maintenance around those openings. Whereas with butyl, the oozing out will be a pain as, as you were saying. And, and it, it won't be solid all the way around but it'll, it'll be wavy and so you're gonna have to, uh, especially during the summer, go through and maintenance that because if there's if there any areas that will have caulk, which will be most areas, you're, you're gonna have caulk voids where the water will get in. So yeah, I got done with one section, then I gotta go do this somewhere else. It just, it's something that's gonna continue to be a problem yeah. and year after year it's, it's gonna be a problem. Especially your first two, three years, it's going, it's going to be a major problem. After that, it might slow down a little bit, but you're, it's gonna continue to be a problem. Okay, um, and then the, the other factor, so we solved an issue with the maintenance factor because um, you know the Mylar tape is a big benefit there. We don't have the maintenance like you would on the Butyl Putty, but there's also an issue with water that often happens with oh, yeah. Butyl Putty as oh, well. Yeah. See, with, with your Mylar, you have a plastic backing. It, this, the Mylar will not dry out. We know that caulk and butyl will dry out. So mylar is our primary seal, will not dry out. Butyl, as your uh, primary seal, will dry out. So we, everybody puts caulk on the outside and the idea is the caulk will eventually crack. You'll always want a maintenance. And, uh, and so with this, with, with the mylar, you have a plastic backing. Let's say your caulk cracks, you don't see it happen and water gets behind it. Uh, it, the water will get behind back to the mylar. The mylar has a plastic backing going and wrapping your walls and there will be, water can't get into your, into your walls. And the idea is that the water will come and ooze out of the bottom. And uh, with the butyl, if the caulk cracks, you're just asking for water to get in behind your wall, causing a delamination. All right, and, then and that's not, that, we're still just talking about the rear Real. Rear wall, real. but remember that's windows, that's everything where the competitor, what the competitors will do. All right, so you're, you're talking about delamination issues that could be increased. Um, so, you know, overall- Going into the floor, yeah. rotting your floor out. So these are all extra problems and then this is something that you're not gonna be able to handle yourself, right? No, no you're, you're going to have to go to the service, e either it's at your dealer or at the trailer factory where they build them, where they, their service centers, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna drop the unit off one weekend and get it the next weekend. You're gonna be without a, without a unit, uh, an RV for a couple months. So the bottom line is, uh, you know, you're, you're saving yourself on, on maintenance. It's gonna be a lot easier to have the Mylar tape versus the Butyl Putty in terms of maintenance, but also you're gonna, 
you're gonna prevent the fact that you're not gonna have as many issues with delamination no. and, and things like that. So these are the advantages you're getting with the Mylar tape, which you're gonna see not just on solitude, you're also gonna see it on momentum. You're gonna see it on reflection, imagine, and transcend. It is a golden thread for Grand Design RV is the Mylar tape, and one of the many reasons you need to go out to your local dealer and check out Grand Design RV. Hi there, my name is Emily Staley. I'm with Grand Design RV. We're gonna shoot a special video today about how you can camp comfortably in a 50 amp coach on a 30 amp circuit. Um, the first thing you're gonna want to have is to make sure that you have a 50 to 30 amp adapter plug. This is gonna be where you're gonna plug your actual 50 amp cord in, and then this piece is gonna plug into the 30 amp box pole at the campground. One of the first things you're gonna to wanna to remember is that when you're first plugged in to 30 amps, the charger is gonna go into a bulk charge mode, which consumes 12 to 15 amps of power, approximately. You have to give it a couple of hours of charging um, time or turn off the circuit breaker for the converter to free up the amps. This will give your coach enough time to kinda of just get prepared for a longer process of being on 30 amps when you're in a 50 amp coach. One thing to always remember, you have to be very cautious about the amperage that you're using. Obviously, you can't go over 30 amps or you're going to pop a breaker at the post. In your owner's manual, there is a page that describes to you about everything that has and what the amperage is and what it pulls. You're going to want to refer to this before you start putting things on, turning things on, um, using the microwave and different things like this. It's very detailed information, so be sure to read over it. It is very possible to camp comfortably. A lot of people say that they don't like to not be able to run their um, two air conditioners. However, there are things that you can do. If you run your main air conditioner during the day and circulate a fan throughout the coach, that cool air will circulate throughout. Come back around dinner time, flip that air conditioner over into your bedroom air, and you'll be able to have the bedroom cooled down by the time you go to bed. The next thing you're gonna wanna remember, some of these things pull a larger amp draw. Things like a microwave, things like a hair dryer. These things will have to be used sparingly when you're running something like your air conditioner. When you use that, you're gonna wanna flip your air conditioner off for the short process that you're using the microwave to say pop a bag of popcorn or warm up some lunch, anything like that. And then as soon as you're done, you can go ahead and flip that air conditioner back on. The other thing that you're gonna wanna remember is to save on that electric amp draw, run your refrigerator and your water heater in the gas position. So you're gonna wanna run off of your LP instead of your electric. During the day, be sure to turn off your 12 volt lighting to ensure that the converter is not bulk charging your battery. Another friendly reminder, if you're going to be experiencing some extreme temperatures, make sure that you go ahead and keep your blinds closed on all of your windows. That'll help keep some of the sunlight out to keep it cooler inside. Make sure that your air conditioners are running at their peak performance. You're gonna wanna make sure that your filters are clean and another thing you can do is you can actually run, if you have them, max air fans or anything like that with the covers closed to help circulate air throughout the coach. So now that you know how to comfortably camp on a 30 amp circuit when you're in a 50 amp coach, if you have any other questions or concerns, you can give us a call at 574-825-9679 and speak to any of our representatives. Have a great camping experience and we'll see you soon. Angel DiCarlo of Grand Design RV here with our product manager, Greg Cody. Greg, we're talking about the quad seal. Obviously that means four seals for those doing the math at home. Take us through what uh, four seals we have. So we have a base seal of Mylar and then PVC foam on top of that. And then our uh, PVC foam behind our moldings. And then we do a cap seal on, uh, on both sides of our molding with silicone. All right, uh, why do we do that? Well, uh, one, it's a superior seal. Uh, what, mostly you'll see is the uh, 
butyl putty oozing out of there, where this stuff is good to minus 60 degrees and good to 212 degrees. So your expansion contraction rate is much more significant with this, and this stuff will outlast our lifetime. All right, so we got no maintenance, long lasting, and superior seal. Where on the RV do we see the quad seal on the Transcend and the Explore? So we'll see it at the sidewall to the floor, sidewall to the back wall, sidewall to the front wall, and then sidewall to the roof. Overall, obviously going with uh, four seals, uh, part of the mission here at Grand Design to, to really go that extra mile? Yes, we uh, have a three-year structural warranty that we want to stand behind, and this will definitely help you know, give you a much longer uh, lasting unit. Uh, by having these seals that you don't have to reapply and, and check up on all the time because it's a maintenance-free seal. All right, again, no maintenance, long-lasting, superior seal. It's the quad seal, and you'll see it on the Transcend and the Explore. What we have here is a Swintech system that is out of time. The way you know it's out of time is because this side is fully extended, as opposed to this side, which is still approximately four inches from full extension. The way to retime the Swintech system is simple. You would go to the switch and depress the out button until the slide out fully extends. You would then depress the in button and bring the slide in eight to 10 inches. We would then repeat this process a minimum of three times until the system fully retimes. The way you'll know the system has retimed is because both sides would then extend or retract at the same time. The reason we need to run the system in and out three times is to give the system an opportunity to resync itself. The Schwintec system has two motors that counts revolutions. This is what keeps the system in sync or parallel. When the system is not fully extended or fully retracted each and every time, the controller loses its zero point. When we run the system in and out three times, it allows that controller to find the zero point. Now let's talk about preventing your system from getting out of time. When you extend or retract the system, at the end of the stroke, you want to stay on the switch for approximately three to five seconds to assure that the controller is able to recognize the zero point. Hello, Grand Design family. Emily Staley here, talking to you about how to dewinterize the P1 Nautilus system. Spring has finally sprung here in Northern Indiana and we are ready to get camping. So let's get to it. The first thing you're gonna to want to do is to remove your water filter, dump out any antifreeze solution that may be in there, fill it with some fresh water and go ahead and put it back on. Don't put the filter in quite yet. You will then go to your city water connection and you will put your hose in. The first thing we're going to do with this is we're going to go to City Inlet to Fixtures. Turn the knobs in the correct pattern. However, this red knob, which is your water heater, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that this stays bypassed during this process. You will then go to all of your interior faucets, turn them on, run water until the pink runs clear. You will come out and do any exterior showers as well as your low point drains. Once the water has run clear from all faucets, outdoor faucets, as well as your low point drains, you can go ahead and power fill the tank. You will still keep the water heater bypassed. Turn the knobs in the direction that they require, keeping your hose hooked up and your water source on. Press the pump on to filter out any residual antifreeze that might be throughout your pump. Let that run for a little bit, and then you can go ahead and dump your fresh tank. After you have used the power fill option, you can use the sanitize option. Again, always keeping the water heater bypassed. You're going to turn the knobs in the direction it requires for sanitize, 
please refer to your owner's manual for the solution to sanitize the system. You'll run that through by putting your pump on and you can go ahead and dump your fresh tank when that's through as well. After you sanitize your system, you'll go to your water heater. You will reinsert the anode rod, tighten it down, and you will go to your pressure relief valve and flip it open. We'll now go back to the panel and we will now fill the hot water heater. We will go to the city water, turn the knobs. We will now open the hot water heater valve. We'll go to our water source, turn it on, and allow the water to fill the hot water tank. Once the water comes out of the pressure relief valve, you will snap the pressure relief valve closed. After all of these steps have been completed, you can go ahead and reinstall your water filter. You will wanna make sure that the water source is turned off when you do that. You will also wanna make sure that your water source is turned off anytime you turn any of the knobs to change the position. When hooked up to city water, you wanna make sure that you don't run your pump as well. There you have it, folks. This is the dewinterization on the Nautilus P1 system. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our customer service team can be reached at 574-825-9679, or you may email them at customerservice at granddesignrv.com. Happy camping, everyone. Hello Grand Design family, Emily Staley here, and we are gonna to talk today about dewinterization. Spring has finally sprung here in Northern Indiana, and it's time to pull our campers out and start camping. Most of you more than likely winterized your unit using an antifreeze. We are gonna talk about how you can flush the antifreeze out of the system and make sure that the unit is ready for camping. First step you will want to take is to go back to your low point drains and prepare them for the dewinterization process. You will want to unscrew both of them completely. Your second step after opening the low point drains would be to go indoors and open up your kitchen faucet, your bathroom faucet, and your shower. Once you have opened up the low point drains and all of the interior faucets, you're gonna come out to your water distribution panel and make sure it's turned to city water. You will then hook up a hose to your inlet and turn on the water. The water is going to run through the open faucets and it will take the pink out. And once it starts running clear, you can turn the faucets off. You will also want to press on your pedal of your toilet to allow water to flow into the bowl and down into your tank. Do that until the water runs clear. Be sure to include your outdoor shower, run the water until it goes clear, and if you have an outdoor port, you will also want to hook your hose to that and run that until the water runs clear. You will then go to your water heater bypass valves and put them into normal operation mode. They should have been in bypass mode through the winterization process. Then you will go to the water heater panel and reinsert the low point drain valve for the water heater and open up your pressure relief valve. Once your water heater has been put back into normal operation mode, you will go back to your water source, you will turn on the water and you will allow the hot water heater tank to fill. Once the water comes out of the pressure relief valve, you will snap the pressure relief valve closed. Once you've completed all those steps and your hot water tank is filled, you're gonna to wanna to come back out to your water distribution panel. You're gonna to wanna to flip this over to fresh tank fill. You're gonna go ahead and fill up your fresh tank and you're going to run a few cycles using your pump. You wanna cycle out all of the antifreeze that may have run through your pump through the winterization process. Once that's complete, you're going to go over and pull your fresh tank drain valve and it's going to drain all of the water out. Once you've completed all those steps, you are good to go and start camping. This is going to be the completion of the standard water system dewinterization.